At 65 years old, adults are twice as likely to be killed or injured by fire. That risk grows with age, doubling by 85. Fire is not the only hazard that threatens our older citizens. Falls lead the cause of death for unintentional injury in the home. 30% of people aged 65 and older are involved in falls each year. This leads to injuries, loss of mobility, and sometimes even death. Reduced mobility hampers movement and may result in failure to escape a fire. Because fire spreads rapidly in the home, sometimes only seconds are left to escape. By giving you the tools and tips to prevent these two issues, we can help you age in place safely. This is Remembering When. I'm here today with Deputy Chief Emerson of the Brunswick Fire Department to discuss how to plan and practice your escape from the home in the event of a fire. It's important for us to realize when we talk about escapes that there's a lot of variables with required exiting. So if you have any specific questions about exiting in your own home, you should contact the codes department or fire department. Uh, what we like to talk about is to know two ways out. Knowing two ways out is a, is a good practice and a general rule of thumb that can be practiced either in a public building or at a friend's house. When you walk into a room, you should ask yourself, is there another way out? If the answer is no, then you should ask yourself, am I safe to be in that room? Most of your larger public buildings have more than two ways out. If you look around, as soon as you get into that building and locate them, it'll prevent you from having to do it in an emergency. If you're having trouble locating them, most of them have illuminated exit signs that will either lead you or point you towards the direction of the door. Make sure whatever exits you're counting on are properly maintained. Make sure that there's no obstacles in the way and that nothing has to be moved on your way to the exit. Care should also be taken to make sure these exits are properly maintained, adequately sized, and removed of any snow or debris. You'll hear continually from public officials that fire safety starts with you, but how seriously do you take it? Is your home properly equipped with smoke and carbon monoxide detection? Do you sleep with your bedroom door closed or open? Are your windows large enough for you to get out? Are they large enough for us to get in? Have you seriously considered the installation of or at least been educated on a residential sprinkler system? Have you developed a fire escape plan? And if so, have you actually practiced the plan? To actually properly practice a fire escape plan is what usually falls by the wayside but it's in fact one of the most important components of the planning process. Small, insignificant items that go unnoticed day to day can crop up in an emergency, causing big problems. Whether it's an escape window that's painted shut, a door that's swollen shut, or a deck board that's been recently replaced and is now blocking your back door, it's always better to notice these things in a drill than it is in an actual emergency. Remember, Plan, prepare, practice to escape fire. You can now contact dispatch centers in the state of Maine by dialing 911 in the text feature of your phone. But do you know when you should be using that? While calling 911 is still the better option in the event of an emergency, texting 911 is now available in the event that making a voice call is not safe. Examples of those times include an invader in the home or an active shooter situation. This option of texting 911 also aids those who are hearing impaired. Always make sure to text your location. When silence is required, text 911. Arranging the home to be safer to prevent falls will help maintain mobility as people age. Falls contribute to injuries, causing further complication to mobility, and can even lead to death. Ensure indoor floor surfaces are safe. Only use floor rugs that have non-slip rubber backing. Smooth out wrinkles in carpeting and secure seams. Outside the home is unpredictable. We cannot safeguard against everything. 
Be vigilant of your surroundings. Look for uneven surfaces. During the winter, beware of slick conditions due to ice and snow. Have someone shovel your paths and driveway to keep clear access in and out of your home. Use sand and salt where needed. Walk like a penguin when on ice and snow. Keep your feet under you. Always use handrails when available. Take it slow, prevent a fall. Wi-Fi is a convenient tool. It seems that it is everywhere. But, unless it is your own Wi-Fi, there are some security tips you should keep in mind when connecting. When on public Wi-Fi, never access any vital accounts. This includes bank accounts or anything that has to do with finance. Don't make purchases with credit cards. No matter how convenient, wait until you are home. Protect your home Wi-Fi with a password only you would know. Don't leave it open for criminals to steal your information. Leave public Wi-Fi for browsing. Keep finances and personal information safe at home. We're here today with Jim Graves, head of Maine Fire Service Institute, to talk about fires that change the world. So Jim, what fire are we going to talk about today? Today we're going to talk about the Beverly Hills Supper Club fire that took place on May 28, 1977 in Southgate, Kentucky. So describe a little bit Southgate, Kentucky for me. Okay, South, Southgate, Kentucky is just on the outside. It's a suburb of Cincinnati, Ohio. It's about 2.5 miles from the city, just over the river. Um, Southgate is, is a, a smaller community, of course, sprawling, a lot of countryside, residential. But there was this, this wonderful uh, nightclub there that started uh, in the early 50s, as I understand it, and in the 70s kind of expanded, and they added on to the building itself, and it became a a, a premier spot for entertainers out of Nashville and Hollywood, um, singing and bands and whatnot. It was a venue for huge weddings. A lot of people went there for their wedding. There was actually a wedding the day of the fire, which is, is kind of part of the whole incident. So. Okay, so what, uh, what decade are we talking about? So this is the late 70s. Jimmy Codd is the president. Uh, the country's in a little bit of a recession at that p present time. Kata had been in office for about a year. There's a lot of stuff going on in the Middle East. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on with the, the Cold War at this period of time in 1977. So um, relatively peaceful, uh, except for in the Middle East. Um, <clears throat> there was a, a time of a lot of strain, the oil embargo and whatnot was, was looming. So there was a lot of people who were looking for a place to, to just relieve some, some everyday stre stress and strain. And this was an option for a lot of people to go to. This particular night, the, the night of May 28th, 1977, Memorial Day weekend, uh, the singer John Davison was there. And of course, John Davison being you know, an entertainer from Hollywood, drew a big crowd. And the building was very large and sprawling and had been added onto a lot, which made it quite difficult for exiting and a lot of corridors and, and additions and whatnot. There was a wedding being uh, conducted in the zebra room of the facility. And they had complained to the staff that it was very, very warm in that room. And they had tried to adjust the temperature and whatnot, and it did not seem to, to help. There was no hints of smoke or anything at that time. So that wedding left and then in the cabaret room which was down a long corridor was where the big entertainment, entertainment was going to happen and John Davison was actually on stage when the first signs of fire, <clears throat> when the first alerts of fire became in the building. And there was no fire alarm system, no public announcement system, so a bus boy broke in and got up on stage and said, I need you to start to move to the exit. There is a fire in the building. And the, the way the building was laid out, the interior finishes, no sprinkler system, no fire alarm system. The fire grew rapidly 
Um, it was actually first seen in the ceiling of the zebra room. It grew quite rapidly, fed by the tablecloths and the, the carpeting and the interior finishes, that it went down the hallway, and by the time it got to the cabaret room, this fire was was pushing hard insofar as it had a lot of velocity behind it. And the panic ensued. It was around 9 o'clock at night, so it's dark. Um, at about 9, 10, the power was lost and the place fell dark. Uh, Fire Department emergency services were obviously responding. Um, there was an effort to rescue as many people as possible. Unfortunately, um, I believe it was 156 people perished uh, that night. Um, so you had you had a uh, fast fire travel, a, a lot of fire load, yeah. and also you had a lack of sprinkler system, a lack of fire alarm system that contributed to people not getting out in time. Correct. Now, were the exits blocked or were there not enough exits also for people to get out? The exits became blocked with panicked um, patrons, but there was not proper exiting. There was no proper exiting for the, that was identified later on in the investigation. There's no sprinkler system, no fire alarm system, no warning. Mm -hmm. So they had very little warning as this fire broke out. Um, as I understand it from, from reading about the, the fire itself, uh, once it came into the cabaret room, it, it just it pushed in a lot of smoke and heat before the fire actually got there. And there was no fire doors to hold it back. Um, so people started to panic and they started to run in every different way. And uh, John Davidson's band director uh, or um, manager was lost in the fire. Mm -hmm. So there was also a lot of heroics that night. A lot of people did, like that young, Walt, I think his name was Walter Bailey. Um, I can check that fact. Um, was w one of the ones that got people moving. He was accredited for saving hundreds of lives because in all reality with a hundred and 56 people dying that evening, um, it could have been a lot worse because they were overcrowded. The, the space could hold 900 people and there was 1,500 people in that space that evening. So there was heavy overcrowding. So occupancy load, there, there is a reason why we have an occupancy Absolutely. load in buildings. And right. it, uh, just talk a little bit about that. Why is that so important? Well, occupancy load is important because when you get people and you put them in a situation where they're alerted or are scared, panic can ensue. So you want to have lighting, uh, you want to have proper exiting, exiting capacity, okay? Each exit can, can carry so many people per minute out through it. So you would want to have your exits arranged in such that they're available and operating, they're not locked. Uh, individuals can get out soon and quick and fast. So a space like that, you'd want it to be emptied as fast as possible <laughs> under a minute, if you possibly could, with the arrangement of exits. And that's why it's important also for you when you're inside a building to know oh, where absolutely. all your exits are. Yeah, as, as a matter of fact, I was, I was talking with, with folks before we filmed this, um, that after this fire as a young boy, uh, I was always worried when we went out to different places to make sure there was exits. And I talked to my parents about it at a very early age that we need to set near an exit <laughs> because back in the 70s there was candles on tables there was you know there was no sprinklers in a lot of the uh, occupancies because uh, the codes did change over time so absolutely so something like this even though you weren't directly impacted by it in the community it still left somewhat of an uh, impression upon you absolutely i mean all these fires that took place when i was a kid are the reason why i became first a, a volunteer firefighter and, and then a career firefighter and then worked in the fire marshal's office and then fire training is big for me because I've always felt like we need to be prepared to handle any incident that comes up and that's why your training is so important. Mm. So Jim, what was the result of the fire? What came from this fire? When, when the fire was totally out, which they didn't completely get it out until the next day, the firefighters worked through the night. They were pulled out of the building at 1130 due to concerns that the roof would collapse. So firefighting efforts ended at around 11.30 at night and the building continued to smolder for a day or so after. Um, and then they, they started to understand the full impact of the fire. So I've said 156 people died. That, that's what died there that, that evening. A temporary morgue was set up on the grassy hills around that surrounded the Beverly Hills Supper Club and they later moved it to a, um, to a uh, armory.
where they created a temporary morgue so families could come and identify the bodies. Th this is very tragic. I mean, to, to live through something like this, I don't think the individuals that went through that night will ever, ever, ever forget it. Um, so they, all in all, 165 people perished mm -hmm. um, in that building. And there was countless, you know, reports and of heroism by people, you know, helping pull people out um, and whatnot. Um, it also resulted in the first enterprise liability suit ever. And this was a lawsuit where they went after owners, contractors, entertainers. They went after everybody they possibly could to see that the victims, the 165 people, people that perished and the 200 plus that were injured with burns, some severe burns that survived, others with minor burns, cuts, abrasions, broken bones, um, received some type of funds out of the result of that fire. John Davison, uh, being the noble and, and benevolent man that he was, did a lot of fundraisers for the victims mm -hmm. uh, because he was there that night and he never wanted to speak of that night ever again, but he did do what he could to raise money for them, mm -hmm. which was very noble. Um, I, if I may, I would, I would like to read a quote that's very powerful to me as, as a, have been a firefighter and never wanted to have to deal with something like this. <clears throat> the quote is from Bruce Roth, uh, Fort Thomas Volunteer Fire Department. <clears throat> and his quote is this, when I got to the inside doors, which is about 30 feet inside the building, I saw these big double doors and people were stacked like cordwood. They were clear up to the top. They just kept diving out on each other, trying to get out. I looked back over the pile of, it was dead people. They were dead and alive in the pile. And I went in and I just started to grab them two at a time and pull them off the stack and drag them out. And I just, I mean, I can't imagine. I mean, you're a firefighter currently serving. Imagine being faced with something like that. Mm -hmm. These are human lives, you know, and, and there's a lot of impact for something like this. So, I mean, the codes change. They always do. American society is very reactionary. Instead of being proactive, they're reactive. And that building should have had been outfitted with a fire alarm system and a sprinkler system. It wasn't. Our life safety codes have improved. Anytime you have over 100 people with live entertainment now in the state of Maine, uh, you have to have a sprinkler system. Um, so we don't have those, we don't want those tragedies to happen in our state mm -hmm. at all. So. Well, even though from tragedy, at least something good comes from it, which like you said, are the changing codes, you know, trying to make people's lives a little bit safer. So right. I wouldn't say a silver lining, but at least Absolutely. At least we are moving in the right direction when it comes to fire protection and fire prevention. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Welcome back to our segment on fraud awareness. Again, I'm here today with Jane Margeson from AARP and Commander Mark Waltz from the Brunswick Police Department. How are you both doing today? Just fine, thank you. Good. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, today we, we wanted to call this, this segment Opportunity Knocks because mm -hmm. scammers are really good at finding out you know, when the next opportunity is for them to try and take our hard on money. So right now, um, you may have heard that Medicare is actually issuing new cards to all Medicare beneficiaries across the United States. Mm -hmm. Why are they doing this? Well, because the old Medicare cards had a social security number on it with just a, a letter attached to it. So having your social security number on a Medicare card was never a good idea. And thanks to legislation from a couple of years ago, that we're now actually going to have new Medicare cards that have no social security number, don't even say whether you're male or female, and don't even have your signature on it, which is great wonderful. However, 60 million people across the United States are getting their new Medicare cards over the course of a year. Um, it just started in June in Maine um, in 2018, but it's going to take basically a full year for everyone to get their new cards. So scammers, of course, are taking full opportunity and they are now calling individuals, telling them they either have to pay to receive their new card or that they're from Medicare and that they, in order to receive the new card, certain information has to be verified. 
None of these things is true. So right. important to, to know this. If you're a Medicare beneficiary, you are going to get your new card automatically. You do not need to pay for it. It's simply going to come in the mail to you. Um, please dispose of your old card responsibly. Please shred it. Do not just throw it away in the trash because it still has your social security number on it. I know some banks that you're part of. So for instance, at my bank, if I bring in my credit card, they will take my credit card and shred it for me. That's so great. That is a possibility as well, as uh, if they would feel comfortable going into their bank yeah. and seeing if their bank does that, there would also be an opportunity to shred that card as well. And some police departments will do that as well. They have yeah. shred, you know, even just small shredders sure. on the site, yeah. and they'd be glad yeah. to shred the cards for you. Um, ARP also offers free shredding events, um, at least half a dozen of them every mm. single year, and we partner with local law enforcement and very often the sheriff's offices to host those shredding events so you can just bring anything as much as you want to those shredding events and we'll take care of it for you for free including our old Medicare cards but please don't just throw them away and be aware that the new cards are coming but it's going to take a while with 60 million beneficiaries and there are 300,000 beneficiaries right here in the state of Maine and I, I really want to uh, hit home on this cutting up a card with a pair of scissors and throwing in your trash is not it's the not same shredding. as shredding. It's no. not. No, yeah. that's a very good point. Is the fire department okay if we burn it? No, I don't, I don't think we'd be okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you can even see the information even after something's been burned too. Yeah. So, um, but I, we have a, a one-page document that I think you're going to show on the screen that describes everything about this particular scam mm. associated with Medicare cards, and we're happy to send that out. It's right up on our website as well. But there's just so much fraud um, within Medicare, unfortunately, mm. and, and some of it involves people uh, selling information and, and uh, supposed Medicare um, equipment online. We were talking about that. Right. Um, and maybe it's someone that's a, you, know, you think it's a real vendor, or maybe it's something you find on Craigslist or something. Mm -hmm. um, so what we want to have you do is, if you put, if you try, try to sell something online or purchase something online, be aware of offers where someone contacts you and tries to either send you more than the the amount is that you want for the good, asking for you to send money back. Um, because those checks, I can guarantee you, aren't real checks. Um, and so what happens is you take the check, you negotiate it at your financial institution, and now you're on the hook with it for your account um, because you say, say they send you a check for 2000 and the item you're trying to sell was only 300 And they say, you know, please send us back the, the difference, the 1700 Well, it turns out the check for 2000 bounced, and then the 1700 uh, you're out. Um, we've also had instances at the police department where we find you've gone from being a victim to maybe all of a sudden becoming an accomplice, maybe by accident, maybe not so much by an accident. If you suspect that this check or that something's a scam, you don't want any part of it. Um, we had a case a couple years ago where someone took this check they thought was probably no good, so they deposited it in the ATM machine, um, and then they intended to keep the money themselves. They never sent it back to the scammer. Mm -hmm. um, we asked them, how come you did that? Well, I thought it might not be good, and that's why I didn't take it to a teller, because I don't want the teller to notice it. Um, but there's sometimes some of these scams where someone asks you to ship goods for them, so they mm -hmm. claim they're going to pay you money to reship items, and all of a sudden you're getting items at your house and you're resending them. Well, now you've become involved in the thing, and if you've started to benefit from it, um, you could end up being charged with a crime. Um, so again, if, as soon as you smell something's a scam, you want to disengage yourself from it. You don't want to try to become one of the scammers yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I always think to myself, the, the, best, the best thing to do is if it wouldn't happen for a business, as in the exchange of goods, the pay itself, mm -hmm. if it seems outside the realm of normal, you probably shouldn't go along with it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And it's interesting that you bring up the, uh, the shipping aspect of it, you know, shipping goods for other people. Again, it's one of those things where if it has to go from that person to you to someone else back to this person to you, it's, it's not, mm -hmm. th this isn't the way things work, right? It's, right. It, you're buying a, a product, it goes from that seller to you, the buyer, and then it should be transaction done. Mm -hmm. And scammers will use, um, you know, the, 
just the name Medicare in all kinds of ways. We've talked about mm. the Medicare card, but they will actually make phone calls and say they're from Medicare and that they've got equipment that they can sell to you at a discount or you know something like this. And it's 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 very distressing because people need Medicare. I mean, people mm -hmm. need it for health care and they also need it for um, equipment they may need in their home. I mean, it's just it covers such a wide array, but scammers know so many tricks associated with just using that name. So um, again, you know, we've talked about this so many times with that stop and verify phrase. It's just such a good one. Yeah. And in terms of buying and selling online, I know the Brunswick Police Department has this wonderful thing right at the station. If you're buying anything online and you're going to be exchanging the goods with somebody in person there's an exchange of money for the mm -hmm. merchandise you can actually go to the police department and they have designated parking spots where this transaction can take place right on police property um, even with an officer present I believe so if there's any question that this is sort of a bad deal likely the, the scammer is not want to not want to actually go mm. to a police department mm -hmm. to exchange money for goods. So yeah. it's a good idea to, to get involved with that too. Mark, are those uh, spots monitored? Yes, they're part of our surveillance system for the building. You can also see them from the dispatch window, but it's all camera recorded as well. Great. So even if there's not an officer out there and you're exchanging goods with someone else, there's someone watching. There's someone. There's some kind of uh, visual. There's a record of the transaction. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yep. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, anything else you'd like to talk on the Medicare scams or Craigslist scams? I might add just um, different type of fraud. But look at your bills. Mm -hmm. Occasionally there'll be times when uh, Medicare is not charged appropriately, or maybe maybe someone gets a hold of your number and your number is getting charged for services you never received. And so it's always good yeah, to look at your bills, true. make sure that you actually got the health care that's mm -hmm. described in them. And if not, uh, there's actually special folks at the Attorney General's office that help prosecute that type of fraud. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, lots of resources, lots of information. You know, again, viewers at home, you can always go to the links that we have at the end of the show. Do the research, protect yourself, and until next time, stay safe.